This is A View from the Bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. The demography of demons. That's straight ahead on A View from the Bunker. You have blessed us with your support during our first year in ministry. You literally make it possible for us to do what we do. And so as we prepare to head into a new year, we want to return the blessing to you. Through January, we've prepared a number of special offers at the Gilbert House store, and we're featuring The Red Wing Saga, Sharon's wonderful series of supernatural thrillers that teaches spiritual warfare through masterful storytelling with fascinating historical mysteries as the backdrop. Now, all eight novels in The Red Wing Saga, a $160 value, can be yours for just $110, a savings of $50. You'll also find the Derek Gilbert Collection, all five of my nonfiction books, a $100 value for just $70. Those are just two of the special offers available through January at our online store. You'll find it at gilberthouse.org slash store. And as always, we thank you for your prayers and your support. We know Jesus cast out a lot of demons, the apostles did the same, but what do we really know about them, and how did they come to be? Welcome to A View from the Bunker, I'm Derek Gilbert. We're going to try to get through, in this program, a discussion of angels and demons, and uh, the hierarchy of the netherworld, and, well, the spirit realm, actually. We had talked about doing this a couple of months back, decided to uh, hold off the program until this month, and... uh, I think we're finding with the research that we've done behind the scenes that this is probably not going to probably not going to happen in just one show, but we'll see how far we get. Uh, Please uh, take a moment, by the way, before I forget to remind you uh, that uh, our free app gets you all of our content and also protects you against us being, you know, canceled. Just in case we say something, if you're watching on YouTube, God bless you. Please click subscribe and uh, click a little bell for notifications. Share the link around with your friends. But don't be surprised if someday we say something that might get us deplatformed. Uh, when you're playing in someone else's sandbox and not paying for the privilege, they can do that to you. So just be prepared. If you've got our free app, which is hosted by and uh, developed by a uh, Christian company, and they host all of our content, um, they will not cancel us. So all of our stuff is there. Not just this program, but our weekly Unraveling Revelation broadcast, our weekly podcast, PID Radio, and we're uploading archives now going back to 2005. So uh, Sharon and I calculated the other day that uh, we're somewhere on the uh, upper side of 2,100 broadcasts of various types going back to 2005. So plenty of content being moved over to this app. You'll find it at our website, gilberthouse.org slash app, gilberthouse.org slash app app and that gets you all of our content it is free to use and we truly appreciate you checking it out it's got some other great features too like a uh, a bible an audio bible no less with multiple translations so you can read along you can listen along and uh, take advantage of that now joining us our esteemed panel for our monthly iron and myth roundtable discussion this is truly a blessing to get to host this every month first our friendly neighborhood phd the director of the institute of biblical anthropology author of such books as interview with the giant ethno historical notes on the nephilim dr judd burton a best-selling author and award-winning screenwriter author of several series of fiction that incorporates good Theology, Chronicles of the Nephilim, Chronicles of the Watchers, and Chronicles of the Apocalypse. He uh, is online at Godawa.com. We welcome Brian Godawa and the pastor of the Reformed Baptist Church of Northern Colorado in Boulder, Colorado, author of such books as Giants, Sons of the Gods, The Angel of the Lord, a Biblical Historical and Theological Study, and more. You'll find him online at DouglasVanDorn.com, Pastor Doug Van Dorn. Well, fellas, the first uh, conversation, Iron and Myth of 2023, this is going to be somewhat speculative, but should be pretty exciting. This is really uh, some fascinating stuff as we uh, dig into a topic where there's been a lot of speculation over the last couple thousand years as to who or what is it that occupies the unseen realm and uh, what can we learn about the unseen realm and its uh, denizens from uh, from Scripture. Um there, there aren't. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we've got the basic categories of angel and demon, but beyond that, um, where do we go from there? I mean, cherubim, seraphim, ophanim. Um, in, in the New Testament, we got uh, powers, principalities, thrones, dominions. Who wants to jump in here? What do we make of this? All right, I'll point somebody and throw you under the bus. Judd, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor's speech. Well, I mean, it- 
it, it, it does, it does sort of, uh, you know, the topic does sort of beg for a taxonomy, you know, a, a hierarchy. And, um, it's, it's relatively clear in scripture that there, that there's a hierarchy in some places more than others. But for, for me, that journey started with Paul's material in the new Testament. You know, I'm, I, and of course, I'm dialing it back all the way to my childhood, my sort of foundational instruction in, in, in the Bible. And, you know, all of us are, are familiar with that breakdown uh, in Ephesians chapter six. Um, so th- I think that's for a lot of believers, that's where the hierarchical journey really begins. And I think Paul does a good job of kind of. Um, Presenting a, a the, the field manual education, if you will, on the hierarchy of the unseen realm in that that passage in particular. <clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but I'll speak for myself. This whole idea of dominions, thrones, powers, authorities um, that Paul talks about <clears throat> when when I used to think about the unseen realm, those. And I don't know why this is. I, I can't really explain it, but I never thought about those things as being part of it. Huh. Hmm. I think I had a very simplistic view <clears throat> of basically just angels and demons. Yes, me too. Me too. I mean, for the longest time, I think a lot of us do, you know, angels and demons. And demons are fallen angels. Right. Exactly. It's also the common misunderstanding right. biblically. And, and so that um, kind of means that really there's only angels, if you put it that yeah, way. And yeah. an angel is a, uh, it's a creature. It's not a function. So like almost everything that I believed about the unseen realm was pretty much simplistic and wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't remember hearing anything about uh, angels or demons growing up in church. We were at a kind of a high church. Um, it was United Church of Christ back in Chicago, and then we moved out of the city and went to an evangelical Lutheran church. But I don't remember angels or demons ever coming into the conversation, other than you know every now and then Satan would get mentioned when he you know tempted Jesus and and that kind of thing. But it it never they were never discussed in the context of these are entities who even though we can't see them with our natural eyes may still have some influence on the world around us and on you particularly. I think that's probably the default setting of most uh, most American Christians. I think yeah. you're right, Derek. I mean, based on my experience, yep. based on some of the interviews that I've had with people talking about this as well, it seems to be fairly universal. Yeah, and I think that it's also easily, and I, 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 I mean, I'm more in this camp camp too. Is that it's it's more more acceptable to speak of it in terms of in the past, you know. And uh, sp- particularly even in the Old Testament, it's like, oh, okay, well, if they're there in the Old Testament, that's okay. But um, in in our everyday world now, it's much more difficult to accept that as being a reality, you know. And I, and I do think that that there's a whole, there's like wor- worlds of Christians that are separate, you know, uh, the sort of typical evangelicals where at most it's a theological issue and that's about it. And then there's the charismatic Pentecostal and, and that kind of stuff where they sort of like really stress that um, and 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 have a um, a whole sort of life view that that incorporates the angels and demons and such, you know, and it tends to be um, polarized, I think, in some ways, you know, and then now I think that there's a whole new category, which is sort of us guys or, you know, whatever the. Or as I like to call it, the Nephilim nuts. Um, uh, so, so in other words, those of those who are more uh, uh, now attuned and akin to on this understanding of the supernatural, you know, Heiser Heiser uh, sort of opened the door for all of us and, and for a lot of us. But you know, he's a he's a good touch point for that. But um, yes, yeah, so I think that that's a, a whole new sort of paradigm that also opens up to even more categories than I think the traditional Pentecostal demon possession and demon stuff, um, ha, you know, the understandings. It's opened up that understanding. Now, did one of you guys had sent um, a paper for us to read, to look at, the hierarchy of angels? Who was that? Yeah, I, I sent that along. That was uh, something that was developed by a, a deliverance minister back 
more than 15 years ago, Dr. Tom Hawkins. He's since gone home to be with the Lord, and he was recommended to me by Mike Heiser. So, oh, okay. Uh, and okay. this was back in 2005 or six, and I thought, okay, now wait a minute, because uh, I was still very early in this journey. I, I didn't realize that uh, a, a biblical scholar credentialed, you know, with a PhD would actually take deliverance ministry seriously. And as, as we've learned, obviously he does. He's uh, supportive of the work of uh, one ministry in particular that works with people who are um, dealing with those those kind of issues. And uh, that's a central theme in his um, his novels, um, the portent and uh, the facade and the portent. So um, when Mike directed me to this this fellow, uh, I, I paid attention. I contacted Dr. Hawkins and asked if he'd be interested in an interview because I want to learn. And he was not interested in really publicizing what he was doing and, you know, give him credit for that. He wasn't trying to sensationalize it, but, um, hmm, the, 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 the basic point of his, uh, of his paper, if, if, as I understood it was that, uh, and we see hints of this in scripture, that there are some entities that are so powerful that we can, can really bring trouble on ourselves if we're not careful about how we approach interacting with them. That's, that's what I took away from it. Now I didn't, I sent you guys the paper and then I didn't go back and reread it myself. So, you know, forgive me. I went and dug into some other research. Yeah. I I think we should like go back anyway and just um, talk about these categories, you know, uh, or this hierarchy, at least biblically before we do any speculative. Yeah. <laughs> Have you guys ever run across uh this was something that Mike put out I think back in about 2008. So this was uh before he kind of had his big following through the unseen realm and it was on his uh personal blog and he put this is one of the first things I ever read from him. There's a little series called Parsing the Dead where he goes through um these different Old Testament words and uh what they are, the categories. And I was so worried that like he might lose that website or whatever that I, I saved it way back then. So I still have a copy of that and it's been helpful to me over the years because it was really kind of the first thing that I saw anybody ever doing that was trying to think through biblically the categories of who these creatures were. And that that's what really started getting me to think, well, maybe there's more, more going on on the other side than I ever thought. Do you think that some of the... Um that he's expanded that into his books, Angels, and then the second book, Demons, as he brought some of that out. He's definitely those? brought some of it into it, yeah. Oh. I couldn't tell you the page or verse, but right. um, we can, we're can. we certainly going to talk about some of these words, mm-hmm. I think. So, well, let, let's start with with one very basic question. If, if demons are not angels, then what are they and where do they come from? Yeah, well, strictly speaking, biblically... You know, if you look at the if you if you if you look into it biblically, this notion that demons are fallen angels is not true. There's no real biblical foundation for it. However, what are they? And as far as I can see, the own the Bible doesn't actually say anything about their origins, and it really only describes them as you know um, in incorporeal spirits. And um, of course, you know. In the Old Testament, there's really no reference to demons. Maybe you could argue uh, Saul was possessed by a spirit of some kind or something. Um, But that's the only instance, which is very interesting to me. And as I believe there's something theological going on there, we can get into that but later, but messianic. But um, And then in the New Testament, they seem to be incorporeal spirits who are in seek of some kind of habitation of bodies. That's And they're just described as evil spirits. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Is there anything else you guys want to add to that? But that it seems to me like that's the only thing we can see, strictly biblically speaking. Evil spirits and and also unclean spirits. Mm. So there's definitely something about their, uh, you know, about there's a ritual purity element. I, I think to that to that definition. You know, if we're building a, a definition of demon here, uh, and you know, staying within the confines of, of the biblical text gives us that it's then that we have to start looking at, at extra biblical material that's referenced in the in the canon scripture to kind of give us some insight into that that belongs to the same in this case the older Jewish tradition. Uh, but yeah, that that always stuck with me is that is the preponderance of of 
of usage of that phrase in the New Testament, unclean spirit. Very good point. Now, do any of you guys know about the, um, I don't know, the history, the origins of how Christians, um, you know, came to call them fallen angels? Is it just a sort of a, sl- I mean, my my only understanding of it, it just seems to be a typical sloppy, uh, you know, sort of um, cultural you know how we tend to, to sort of uh, simplify things into sloppy terms that become ineffectual, technically speaking. You know what I mean? Um, just like the word angel itself, you know, we all angel is this concept of the winged beings and such. And and um, while cherubim and seraphim have have wings, it's like angels in the Bible aren't described as having wings. We you know they're not the cherubs, the little babies. We've talked about this before, obviously, but you know still for the sake of those in the audience who may not have discussed this at any length, um, none of those things are in there. And the con- the word angel actually is is a word that means messenger. And so while it is connected to spiritual beings. Um, there are many times where it's not connected to spiritual beings because the main point is it's a it's a messenger usually of God in some way, right? So there's no no there's no winged wingedness to it necessarily. <clears throat> they, they might, but it's not biblically defined that way, right? So angels are these like sort of messengers of God. They can be spiritual. They may be like we're we're angels of God. Christians are angels because we bring the message of the gospel. But but strictly speaking, this angel, the Malachim, like in the Old Testament, you know, um, it's something that we've put a lot of cultural baggage onto. And 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 by the way, I'm not against that because I have them. I kind of have some of that in my own novels and stuff. I don't have the wings, but um, uh, you know, um, so so that angel thing. So th- so then when 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 people when Christians think of demons, I think there's a natural tendency as i as i learned it again i think just a sloppy introduction to it that they're fallen angels you know they're they're the ones that you know the oh the you know revelation where the 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 tail of the dragon sweeps and sweeps and 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 they fall to the earth and and one third of the heavenly host and so those must be the fallen angels right and that those that are therefore demons but that's really important to understand that 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 is not truly biblical because if if the if the demons which are dis disembodied spirits and angels, which biblically speaking, angels actually do have bodies. They're, and they're not the same as human flesh, like Jude talks about uh, strange flesh, right? It's not the same flesh, but it is a flesh. And, you know, the, the, you know, Genesis six says they they can have sex with humans. You know, again, that's another controversial thing. Not not in our quarters here, but um, but they also can eat because the angels have visited a lot. They ate food, so they actually have bodies and can somehow, uh, if you look strictly at the biblical information, whatever dimension they are in the the, the Elohim dimension, the spiritual dimension, they evidently also can can cross be cross dimensional and they can eat actual physical food. They can have physical contact with us. They can have sex with humans. So there's a physicality, but as far as I can see, the only thing biblically speaking is they have heavenly flesh, whatever that means. And it's a kind of flesh that can go between the physical and spiritual realms. Kind of like when Jesus could walk through walls after he resurrected, I guess. So um, biblically speaking, that's about all that I I can find. But But what that means is, is that while angels then do have some kind of heavenly flesh, some kind of body, therefore, by definition, evil spirits who are without bodies cannot be angels. And so they are a different being. And angels are sometimes referred to as spirits, but just like we are spirits, right? We're spirits, maybe in bodies. Um, so there's that spiritual dimension that angels are in, but they're not strictly speaking spirits without bodies, and so that's an important distinction that there, therefore when you come to, oh, well, then demons are not fallen angels because they don't have bodies. They're looking for bodies. Makes them a completely different category of being than what this sloppy, you know, I would call it the sloppy evangelical. That's my background, you know. Maybe maybe it's also Roman Catholic. I don't know. But it's sloppy evangelical exegesis of um, what angels and demons actually are. That's, a, that's at least a, a beginning point, I think. I think it's interesting that there doesn't seem to be a word that is specifically uh, translated demon in Hebrew. 
And the Jews, the Jews did not have a word for demon. And, what about Shadim? Well, see, you, you mentioned Shadim, but Shadim is uh, uh, kind of a protective spirit. When you look at the cognates in Akkadian, uh, that was uh, like the Lamasu, those giant winged bulls that stood outside the palace at Nineveh, for example. Those were a type of Shadim. Um, you've got the Seirim, translated goat demons in the Bible. But again, those are embodied things, apparently. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not clear that those are, you know, where or what those things are. I mean, what is a goat demon anyway, or a satyr, or, uh, a, you know, a donkey satyr, or donkey centaur, or centaur de- what we, we don't know, because, uh, and the, again, you've only got three references to that word. Uh, one reference to Seirim in Leviticus 17, and two references to Shedim, one in Deuteronomy 32, and one in Psalm 106. So, considering that the Mesopotamians had a pretty robust cosmology and a demonology in um, Akkadian and Sumerian uh, magical texts. It's kind of surprising to me that the, the, the Jews didn't have one. The Hebrews didn't have a, a, a role for demons in their cosmology, really. that It didn't really seem to get defined until Jesus appeared on the scene in the first century, and, and maybe that's not coincidental. Yeah, if, if I can, I'm going to read those quickly, because I do think this this is important little bit of depth to this. Deuteronomy 32, 17, he's talking about, um, you know, Mrs. Moses um, thing. He's talking about how the Israelites went to Canaan and they worshiped the false gods. And he says, these Israelites sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently whom your fathers had not never dreaded. And um, and then the passage in Psalm 106, they, uh, 37, they sacrificed their sons and daughters, it's the same concept, to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of our sons and daughters, to the idols of Canaan. So what, you know, this this goes into the, you know, the paradigm that we all hear is kind of support, and that is this notion that there is some spiritual reality to the false gods of Canaan, for example, so these false gods of Canaan, Baal, Asher, whatever, there's some kind of real spiritual reality to them. Now, how deep that goes, are there specific entities for every god or not? That's something to talk about. But but on the surface, I think what's important that I think supports what you're saying, um, Derek, is that the word demons is helpful here, but it's not the best translation because mm-hmm. it gives people the notion that right. – there's spirit beings floating around without bodies, but that's not it. So I, I tend to say that the best way of interpreting this contextually is they were demonic, meaning they're evil of the spiritual realm. They're not demons as they are in the New Testament. They are demonic spiritual beings that we all tend that we all see as connected to the watchers or the the uh, the gods of the nations who have s- real spiritual reality behind them. Mm-hmm. Those are the only two places where demons is used. And then, you know, I mentioned the one thing about the evil spirit with Saul. I don't know of any other any other situations uh, where that comes up. So we got a lot of things going on here. <laughs> um, I-, I wanted to address one more issue that we brought up at the very beginning in terms of other things that the scripture might say about them, especially the Old Testament. And this isn't specific, but in terms of the word demon, but I wanted to get your guys' thought on it because we do have several passages that talk about the Rephaim being in Sheol. And those are connected universally with the Jews of Jesus' day and then of the earliest church with the demons. So if that's true, um, then I would think that that would have to add at least a tiny bit more to what the scripture says about demons. Fair what enough. do you guys think about that? I think that's a valid conclusion. And certainly when you compare it to um, when you can, when you start looking at this stuff linguistically, uh, like the occupants of Sheol, for instance, the, the Rephaim, uh, when you start comparing it to similar kinds of, of underworld deities uh, underworld spirits like you find in mesopotamia and uh all, all along the coast of the levant um and in, even in, into uh you know in, in, in all the way into turkey even um uh, i i think that starts to to make a lot of the stuff pop to life and into into reality uh 
when you see that that linguistic connective tissue. And I touched on this in a paper that I wrote last year about about words that were used in Eurasian languages for um, uh, rulers. That they were all, you know, in, in one way, shape, or form, they shared this initial R vowel morpheme uh, that that carried the residue, if you will, of this idea of of veneration. Uh, to borrow a, a a title from a very excellent book on the subject, veneration of these things in the uh, the underworld, in this case, shale or the obsu. Well, so, I, I, and actually, actually I was going to... Do you think that we can conclude, Judd, that um, there is biblical reason to say that the Rephaim uh, are demons? Or can you only keep that in the realm of just what the cultures of those days thought? I don't, um, are, are you saying that the two have to be mutually exclusive? No, I'm not saying they have to be mutually exclusive. But what I'm saying is... In order to make an argument, because the you know we haven't said it explicitly tonight, we said it other nights, but everybody in the early church and all the early Jews believed that the demons were the disembodied Nephilim. So they're not the fallen angels; they're the they're the disembodied um, spirits of their progeny. So mm -hmm. the idea is, where did they get that from? And what I'm asking the question is, could they have derived that from the Bible? Or did they necessarily also have to have the help of the cultures around them in order to get that idea? I, th I think it was the cultures That's around them. I think it was the cultures yeah. around them. And uh, this, this was, you know, and, and thank you, Jed, for, you know, hinting at the book Sharon and I wrote Veneration. And I, I cited the paper that you wrote, by the way, on the reference to the Rephaim in my book, Second Coming of Saturn. But... Uh, one of the things that surprised us when we were researching veneration and this idea of venerating the dead was how uh, prevalent this was in the cultures around ancient Israel. When you start looking at uh, the uh, the texts out of Ugarit and realize that these uh, Amorites at the time of the judges were uh, actually had a temple in their uh, in their city that was devoted to the uh, the council of the Ditanu, which was this underworld, uh, these underworld deities connected to the Rephaim, uh, and that Ditanu, according to scholar Amar Anus, is where the Greeks got the name of their old gods, the Titans, who were, you know, the old gods who formerly ruled before they were overthrown by the Olympians and banished to Tartarus. Peter, in 2 Peter 2, 4, says that those angels who sinned, the reference back to Genesis 6, were the, the entities that had been banished by God to Tartarus. And in the Old Testament, every time we see, this is the thing that surprised us, when we see references of the prohibitions on sacrificing children, and this comes back to uh, Psalm 106, uh, sacrificing children, specifically to Molech, it's connected in Leviticus 20, verses 1 through 6, and also in Deuteronomy, uh, uh, Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 through 12, connects the practice of sacrificing children to Molech to the practice of turning to mediums and necromancers. In other words, trying to consult the spirit realm, specifically the spirits of the dead, for information. And I, I cited uh, something that Mike Heiser wrote in uh, uh, Second Coming of Saturn, the unifying principle of verses 1 through 6, this is Leviticus 20, verses 1 through 6, a prohibition against sacrificing to Molech, using mediums, necromancers, and so forth, is not merely illegitimate cultic pra practices, but the practice of the cult of the dead. This realization makes sense also of the condemnation of the guilty party's entire clan in verse 5. We saw at Mari and Ugarit, those were uh, major city-states in the uh, ancient Near East. The cult of the dead is a family affair to secure the blessings and avert the wrath of past family for the sake of the family present and yet to be. Now in Psalm 106, the reference there to sacrificing children to demons, you go up a few verses to uh, verse 28, and uh, we find that the reason God sent the plague that killed 24,000 Israelites on the plains of Moab before they crossed over and attacked Jericho was because they were eating sacrifices offered to the dead. That was part of the, the worship of the cult of Baal Peor, and that word Peor in that context, it's a, based on a Hebrew word that means c gap or cleft or opening. And in this context, meanings probably the entrance to the netherworld. So Baal Peor was the lord of the entrance to hell. 
and the Israelites had drawn been drawn into that worship by eating sacrifices they were offering to the dead. So this this appears to be part and parcel of this practice of sacrificing children to Molech. And um, I, I think I think the reason that we don't see references specifically to demons in the Old Testament is because English language translators looked at Rephaim and didn't understand what the Rephaim were to the ancient Israelites and their neighbors. They didn't realize this was a special class of spirit in the af- in the afterlife that was believed to be the ancestral spirits, specifically the ancestors of the royal houses of the Amorites, who had to be sacrificed to and appeased in order to secure their blessing. And then, of course, you had the household deads. Those were represented by the teraphim, which uh, you know Jacob's wife stole from her father. Uh, David's wife, Michael, had one of them in, in their bedroom, which is how David escaped the agents of Saul. Um, this was a thing that affected Israel down to the... Isaiah was uh, uh, condemning the practice of eating forbidden food amongst the tombs. And yeah. I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's a coincidence when Jesus cast out the demons from the uh, Gerasene demoniac, you know, we are legion for we are many, who was living amongst the tombs. There was a herd of pigs right next door. There's, I found a scholar, a French scholar, who argues that the only reason pigs, which were forbidden... Uh, unclean in many other cultures in the ancient Near East, the only reason they were even read or raised rather was to offer us sacrifices to the dead. So I think we, I think it's been hiding in plain sight in the Bible, but it's just been translated out because instead of uh, say the, sh- the, the Rephaim rise up to greet uh, mm-hmm. Lucifer when he's cast out of heaven is because it's translated shades. Yeah. You know, there's another, there's another element of this though, too, that is, what I call demonization, where um, the Hebrew, and I don't know if you guys would necessarily all agree with this, but uh, I also wrote about the cult of the dead in my novel, Jezebel, and its corresponding book, The Spiritual World of Jezebel and Elijah. Um, the cult of the dead, and there's another component in the Canaanite, certainly, uh, uh, mythology of Rephaim, which is that they believe that the the Rephaim was, was a reference to... Um, the ancient mighty kings who had died and they were in Sheol or right. uh, however they called the, the underworld, the Canaanites did. And um, so these kings were down there. And so when there was a new king, they would engage in a cult of the dead ritual mm-hmm. that would call upon the approval of the Rephaim kings in Sheol, right, to get the approval of the new king and the acceptance of the old king dying to go down into that world, right? Right, right. The last, king so that, of, the last king of Ugarit, when he died, they had this ritual. That's one of the texts that have been translated. It was a KTU 1.161 or something, a, a, a ritual basically to summon the old kings to come back yes. and escort this, this last guy down to, um, uh, you know, down to join the, the Council of the Ditanu, the Council oh, of the, the Titans. Titans. Yeah. Yeah. And that is in my novel, Jezebel, by the way, that whole ritual I put in there. Sweet. But, and, but seriously, though... Um, uh, so, like for example, in Isaiah 14, there is a component in which they, they ref, you know, I think sometimes the Bible refers to um, two ancient mythologies, and they demonize them. And for instance, I mean, that's kind of what's going on with the, um, you know, Amar Anus, you know, talked about the Mesopotamian origins of the Apkalu, and 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 he makes the argument that that's kind of what they're doing in Genesis six. You know, they're demonizing the same mythology, right? Um, and so in Isaiah 14, the shale, n- n- verse nine, shale beneath is stirred up to meet you. He's, he's so, first of all, Isaiah is condemning the king of Babylon. And he's saying, you know, you're going to die and you're going to go down to those mighty kings that rouses the shades or the Rephim, as, as Derek said. It's, it, it's not apparent in, in the translation, which is not a good thing. It rouses the Rephim to greet you, all who were leaders of the earth. Mm-hmm. It raises from their thrones all who were kings of the nations. This is a mockery, actually, that's going on. He says, all of them will answer and say to you, you too have become as weak as we, you have become like us. Your pomp is brought down to shale. The sound of your harps, maggots are laid as a bed beneath you, and worms are your covers. And he goes to, oh, how you are fallen, oh, star, day star, morning star, sun of the dawn. This is that that passage that many people believe is reference to Lucifer. Mm-hmm. I don't, but that's okay. It's, I'm with I, you. I do. I do actually use it in the new. I'm writing a. Uh, I'm I'm writing a movie. Uh, 
about Jesus called Messiah. And and I'm trying to incorporate a few of these little things we have in there. I don't know if they're going to go for it, but I actually do use that that sort of storyline because we have a, a, a Lucifer or we have a, a Hasatan character that I call the accuser. I made I make trying to make him change the name from Satan to the the accuser, right? So I, you know, so I accept it to a certain degree if if it, you know, for the for the story. But but I'm I'm off topic. I'm sorry. So so my point here is that that passage to me is it takes their mythology and it mocks it and it says, oh yeah, okay, you're gonna die, you're gonna be accepted by these kings, but actually it's weakness because you're dead, you you know, you're weak, your bed is a bag of bed of maggots. It's the opposite of what you think it is. And so I actually think that that's powerful. Again, this is my, you know, sorry, my, my, um, what, what do you call it? My, my bang that I drum all the time. This is a subversion going on where they incorporate the mytho- the pagan mythology, but they subvert it, you know? Um, but, or you can call it demonizations. Like the thing that you call these mighty kings, these mighty refrain, they're actually demonic. They're actually weak, worthless, useless shades. They're not mighty kings. You know I mean? That's kind of, and I'm not saying that that's all always the case, but th- that's certainly the case in a few of these passages that I've seen, if that makes any sense. We also see something similar in Ezekiel 32, a polemic against the king of Egypt, where he uh, says yes. that he's going to fall down and be sent to uh, uh, sent to Shale, where uh, in the midst of Shale, you've got the mighty chiefs, the chiefs of the Gibberim, shall speak of them with their he- helpers out of the midst of Shale, I get a little speculative on that in uh, uh, Second Coming of Saturn. I argue that uh, Assyria is there, uh, that I suggest that that's actually Asher or Enlil or El or Dagon or Molech. It's a reference to uh, that particular entity. Uh, But again, I admit that's really speculative. But I do think it's interesting that you've got these mighty chiefs. And then when you look at the the the, the Septuagint translation, rather, which was... uh, you know, the, the leading Jewish religious scholars of the Second Temple period, you know, 3rd century B.C. translated this and understood that those entities that they're calling the mighty chiefs are the giants who had fallen from eternity, who descended into Hades with their weapons of war. <laughs> so it's clear that they made that connection, that these are the giants destroyed in the flood who are in the midst of Shale and Assyria. There's in the uttermost reaches of the pit, you know, as far away as you can get. From the midst, it's almost like they've got pride of of place. These mighty chiefs, or chiefs of the gibberim, or the spirits of the giants. You know, I know that we can. Uh, we probably all have our. We 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 haven't talked about specifically, but you know, the etymology of nephilim being not to fall uh, from the Hebrew, from the word nephal, but from an Aramaic word meaning a giant. That's that aside. The field. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Walter Zimmerly, in his Ezekiel commentary on this very passage, Derek, I don't know if you came across this, but he argues that the gibberim are also actually in that passage called Nephilim. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Through the word fall. They do um, not lie with the mighty, the fallen from among the, the uncircumcised. Fallen. Right. And so he actually argues that you could you could translate that Nephilim, which, um, you know, that that seems to bring all these ideas together. Uh, of these creatures on the other side, that the scripture actually is taking that as these uh, giants. Yeah, because Derek, the, where's the fall? Where's that verse about the fall? Uh, that verse is in verse twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Yeah, oh, okay, I was way down there. Yeah, okay. ESV. They do not lie with the mighty, the fallen from among the uncircumcised. But Doug's point is that uh, the word translated "fallen," which is uh, what nephilim, okay. um, nephil, should be should be repointed to read uh, nephilim. Nephilim, but yeah. again, the Septuagint makes it clear that they understood that that was the point of the verse. They do. Yes. They slept with the yeah. giants who had fallen from eternity. What a great turn of phrase. They had fallen from eternity. And that's who you're dealing with, these spirits in Sheol, the Rephaim. Now, interestingly, we, we well, want to bring this together, too, because Rephaim is also, it's one of these very fluid words because Rephaim are also described as the giants in the land that David was was wiping out. So we have sort of clans of Rephaim, and sometimes the Rephaim are also called Anakim or Zamzumim, right? So mm-hmm. Rephaim seems to be a, in if you look up that, that, that word throughout the days of David, right, you see that it's a term re- related to these giants. So there's obviously a 
spiritual connection that's being made between these large, these clans of giant beings that David was hunting down and wiping out or that were hunting David, right? Um, but he was, you know, um, he was taking them out and they're connecting that by name to those demonic, you know, uh, uh, sh- underworld entities. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. There's so so there's that that theological connection that is justifying, you know, why he's wiping them out. Basically, what I, was really interesting, and I, and I cited your book, uh, your novel about David, in a couple of things that we've written about this because we looked at 2 Samuel 21, beginning at verse 15, which is that section of 2 Samuel where David almost gets killed by Ishvi Ben-Ov, and you brilliantly pointed out that uh, that means Ishvi, son of the medium. But uh, I stumbled onto some research by a Hittitologist named Harry Hoffner, who in 1966 wrote that the word ov uh, actually derives from a Hurrian term, abi, which means necromantic ritual pit. And they found one in a site in northern Syria, the site of ancient uh, Urkesh, which was the main Hurrian power center until the time of um, the Exodus, about 15th century BC. This ritual pit went down about 45 feet, and they could only get down about halfway. But um, Hoffner argued that that word, that Hurrian word, Abi, was the original from which not only do we get the Hebrew word Ov, which more properly translated means owner of a ritual pit, it also is the original of the Sumerian word, abzu. Oh, right. In other words, he argued that the Sumerian couldn't, could, you know, the, the Hurrian couldn't come from the Sumerian. The Sumerian came from the Hurrian. And uh, so that, 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 and that's really interesting because the Hurrians are a very ancient people. We can trace back to like the fifth millennium BC in the plains of Ararat, which is where I connected them to Judd's paper on the Rephaim. Well, forgive well, me, but... Entire, go ahead. Entire region through is th- there is such a flow of of ideation relevant to what we're talking about here now you know doug you referenced the the etymological roots of the word nephilim not coming from you know the lower portions of the levant but that that those are it, it's got an aramaic anchor not unlike um the word for watcher in hebrew uh, oh, yeah. Irim, it's related, directly descended from the Aramaic Irim, which interestingly enough means city. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you've got some insight into the kind of of, of fallen, you know, d- demonic sort of cultural engineering that's taking place with this this rough counterfeit of Yahweh's kingdom trying to be recreated by these fallen en- entities on the earth. And so much of that information is is flowing throughout the ancient Near East from this nexus point in northern Syria, southern Turkey, northern Mesopotamia, uh, and this is where all these big bonds are happening now with like places like Gobekli Tepe and Novali Chari and Karahan Tepe. Uh, it, it's this area is becoming exponentially more relevant and important to this topic uh, almost on a weekly basis. Wow. I, I can see already that we're going to have to do a second program on this. Maybe just do this one on demons. We'll do angels on the next one because we're 40 yeah. minutes in and we really haven't gotten to the uh, different angels there. And yeah. <laughs> uh, that that is going to be something to cover, too, because uh, there there's a connection. And the only place watchers are mentioned in the Bible is Daniel 4, but they're mentioned in parallel with the holy ones. And that's a whole other thing, you know, because the Kedeshim are translated as the saints later in the book of Daniel. And that has some really interesting prophetic implications, but that would be a whole new rabbit trail. Um, there are a couple of other places that it's possible to read Watcher. I forget what they are off the top of my head, but I think there's one in Ezekiel, one in Amos, that they're, uh, it, it, based on that same word city, that some scholars have said that it is possible that you could translate this as Watcher there. So well, I think we've, ta- we've talked about that in a previous program, actually, because Sharon and I wrote that into... Uh, I think we wrote that into Veneration or Giants, Gods, and Dragons, mm-hmm. one or the other. But uh, one of them is Isaiah 14, because it, you get to verse 21 where it says, uh, uh, what is it, declare uh, destruction on his uh, children for the sins of their fathers. May the offspring of evildoers never more be named. Prepare slaughter for his sons because of the guilt of their fathers, lest they rise and possess the earth. Yes, this was a veneration because we put that verse on the cover. Lest they rise and possess the earth and fill the face of the world with cities. Interesting. 
What's the what is the the verse? Of course, Isaiah it's in what? Isaiah fourteen. It has to be because it's got, that chapter has everything else in it. So yeah, <laughs> Isaiah fourteen twenty one. Uh, got it. Thanks. And and then the the other place that is really interesting, I thought, was Numbers twenty four, which is the messianic prophecy of uh, Balaam. You know, I see him, but not now. Beginning at verse 17, a star uh, shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Verse 19, one from Jacob shall exercise dominion. Clearly, that's a reference to the prophesied Messiah. And destroy the survivors of cities. Cities. Destroy the survivors of the watchers. I'm so, sorry, I missed that one. I'm, what, what was that that's the second one you mentioned? Numbers 24, verse 19. Those are good. They're, to me, it's like it's a lot like stars and sons of God. You know how in Job thirty-eight seven they're parallel with each other. In the ancient mind, um, like to say, well, which one is it? They would have said yes. <laughs> well, in, in a way, many of these are all terms of the same beings, right? Sons of God. If, if you if you you know uh, look through all the passages, you see uh, concomitant phrases and concepts being applied to them to the same beings called sons of God. Sons of the ho- Most High, Holy Ones. Holy Ones, yep. Um, wa- I, th- I believe Watchers, but yep. Watchers may be may be certain specific sons of God, right? But particularly sons of God also are called, um, uh, what else? There's, some, there's several terms. Um, my Holy Ones, um, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm losing it. Well, but- they're called stars. Star, uh, right, yeah, stars, because they're equated, the celestial beings, yeah. they're equated with the stars. Mm-hmm. And so it's important to understand that all these are used interchangeably, and that's why when you when you bring all these passages together, you see a much more fuller picture of these beings known as sons of God. Oh, uh, heavenly host, that's what I was, what I was thinking of. Oh, the yeah. Heavenly host, which we know surrounds God's throne, um, and so they are... In, in essence, they are beings uh, who who are God's servants, like in um, Second Kings, is it? You know, they 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 perform God's functions, and these sons of God are these high creatures, and they also worship God, etc. Right? So, um, is it the 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 concept is that that some of these sons of God in Genesis six actually fell, came to earth, and those were the ones that made with women. And so those were the fallen, if, if anything, those were the fallen uh, heavenly beings, right? And then their progeny was the Nephilim. So, so that's where all this heavenly imagery is connected with the, the earthly imagery of these mighty beings who are bad people, who are connected to the Rephim and the spirit beings. But it's sort of like a, a, a package of the same thing in some ways, right? Lisa, so yeah, I, I think it. yeah, I think that I think that's true. Um, for the most part, so like for example, the host mm-hmm. of heaven, I would think that that would be a little bit bigger term, encompassing more creatures than just the sons of God. Oh, um, okay. Because there's other creatures that are up there, um, and it's the whole host of heaven that worships Yahweh. So it's not just the sons of God that's worshiping, and everybody else kind of just doesn't have to. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I, I guess I would challenge people to think about some of these New Testament terms as well. And I don't, I don't know that, I think they all overlap. I don't know that they're all identical, but if you have something like a throne or a prince or a principality, those are all sharing almost the exact same ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, But then if you have something like maybe a power, that's a little bit different of a term. So you could have different kinds of powers. I was just thinking, I think Paul in first Corinthians 15 talks about um, the different bodies, you know, uh, heavenly bodies, earthly bodies. I think he says, uh, you know, not, not all bodies are of the same glory, and some stars have different glory than others. So perhaps, you know, the ancients thought of different kinds of entities as stars, not just sons of God, but certainly the sons of God were considered stars. So I think that you have some of that, uh, you know, genus species sort of thing going on. You know, there's there's a an interesting observation that Tim Alarino made in his book, um, Birthright. And uh, we had the opportunity to talk with him about this, pointing out that in the parable of the prodigal son, which is essentially a picture of humanity's journey to rejoin the divine council. I mean, we've sold ourselves out to the swine herd, who's the one in charge of breeding these, these unclean animals. And finally, the son comes to himself 
It says, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? And he returns home. The father, of course, greets him and um, uh, puts a ring on him, puts a robe on him, and says to one of the servants to, uh, you know, uh, kill the fatted calf. And the, the older son, the elder brother, representing the angels who remain faithful, is kind of cheesed about this. Um, you know, look, I've served you faithfully for all these years, and now you're welcoming him back. He squandered his inheritance, this wonderful planet that we were given, and you're welcoming him back. What? But Tim asked a very interesting question. Who are these hired servants? Who are these other servants? I mean, if the older son, the older brother, is the angel in the story, and we're the younger brother, the prodigal kid coming back home through the grace of Jesus Christ, who are these servants? Just an interesting thought. <laughs> now, maybe they're just there for, uh, you know, uh, for narrative... Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yes, because not every component of a parable has a specific reference. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> we all learned that in seminary, don't yes. you know? Don't you know? Uh, well, but, I, but I, suddenly feel, I, I suddenly feel compelled to twist my mustache. <laughs> <laughs> and what a good mustache it is, too, Judd. But I think thank you. What you were, what um. Doug was referring to that, you know, Ephesians 6 talks about we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, right. but against the rulers, right? That's archon, and mm -hmm. against the authorities. And some of these, exodus. by the way, just to pause you there, Brian, some of yeah. these, by the way, I believe have a, a human and supernatural overlap. That's what I'm getting to. Authorities, po cosmic powers, dunamis, I think it is, of this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, I, I tend to think of this as being sort of a, uh, a generic, uh, these are like um, interchangeable terms. He's just sort of, Paul often is, super, uh, what's the word where he, I can't remember the word, but where he just waxes eloquent and over and over again to say the same thing. Um, I'm okay with that. Others think that that means, no, there are actual specific taxonomies of specific spiritual powers. But I think the, the, the generic, the, 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 the most important point is, is it's clear that he's talking about spiritual heavenly places powers, right? And so elsewhere in Ephesians and even Colossians, he, he makes references where he talks about, you know, if, if the if the powers had known about this, you know, about the gospel, they wouldn't have let, crucified our Christ. And, and many Christians will say, well, that's just talking about earthly powers. But if you understand, know that contextually, when he's using those terms, he's using them consistently. Um, he's, he's referring to spiritual powers. But as you said, Doug, as we understand, the ancient world, and particularly the biblical writers as well, believed they they believed that they were one with the heavenly powers. The, the earthly powers were one with the heavenly powers. As above, so below. So yeah. this is the whole, on earth as it is in heaven. So the, the ancient world concept was that earthly powers were connected to heavenly powers. So if there was a war on, on earth, there was a war in heaven. And that's where you get the prince of Persia versus the prince of Greece and Daniel reflecting the very fact that Persia was was uh, you know was taking or I'm sorry Greece was going to be taking away the power from Persia over the the earth etc right and so um, when you understand that then you see that when Paul is just referring to uh, the rulers or the authorities in other passages of Ephesians or Colossians or maybe even elsewhere in the New Testament he's not necessarily talking about just earthly powers he's actually talking about Earthly and heavenly powers connected, sure, but I think in this case he's focusing on the the in Ephesians six for sure he's focusing on the spirit the spiritual powers, um, but it's applied to the other passages. What's the other one, Doug, in in Ephesians where he, where he's talking about they, if they had known they wouldn't have crucified. That's First uh, Corinthians two first Corinthians. verse yeah. uh, six. First yeah, right. six through eight. Yeah, two six Thanks. seven and eight. Yeah, the yeah, rulers of the same. In, this isn't just an old New Testament thing either. Um, when I was preaching through Psalm 2 a few years ago, it really struck me, you know, these famous words from the Messiah, the hand will put for us, uh, you know, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? So, okay, is there a distinction there? Uh, maybe. But what about the next one? And the kings of the earth set themselves and the archons take counsel together. 
Well, why would he say the kings of the earth and then just say the, the same exact thing? I think it's very possible that he's distinguishing between the kings of the earth on the earth and the archons in heaven that they are taking counsel against together against two. Well, in that same verse, you have against Yahweh and uh, Mashiach. And then two, three verses later, two verses later, um, he who sits in heaven laughs and the Lord holds him in derision. You have two again there. So you've got the heavenly father, first power and second power, uh, the Lord, Adonai. <laughs> and so it seems to me that, that, that the psalmist is doing this in several different places. And so it's not just something that we find in the New Testament. The Old Testament is doing the same thing. It, yeah. It's maybe more um, obvious in the New Testament. There are more different terms in the Greek that are applied than in right. uh, than in the Hebrew, because they're the kings of the earth. That's uh, based on melech, uh, the rulers. That's prince, rosh, or head, or chief, uh, not prince. Uh, the, the word for prince is different. Uh, but um, the, you get, you, yeah, right. You got a number of different uh, words in in the Greek that that enter in with the Septuagint and uh, into the New Testament. Then. But at the same time, you, you and, and this with the Hellenization of the world after Alexander the Great, you get this um, uh, these these Second Temple Enochic uh, books that start getting very specific about where demons come from. The Book of First Enoch and some of these terms that we're seeing in the New Testament applied to these spiritual beings like uh, exousia or arche or archon or dynamis, um, uh, stoichia, you know, elemental spirit. And from what I could find, that this was not commonly done prior, really, to the Christian era. And, and really, it's not before you start seeing the Book of Enoch in the 3rd century BC that you get very specific information about the origin of demons, which parallels what the Greek poet Hesiod was writing about the origin of these demons in the 6th or 7th century BC, where he, he, he wrote that the uh, uh, the the... What was the term he used for humans? The um, uh, Marapes anthropoi. Uh, and, yeah, and, and again, Mara, uh, Amar Anus pointed out that that word Marapes is based on the same Semitic root as Rephaim. The Marapes anthropoi, the men who lived during the golden age when Kronos ruled in heaven, the king of the Titans before he was overthrown and sent down to Tartarus, like the sons of God from Genesis 6, uh, when they died, they became daemons and wandered about the earth helping humanity. And interesting that the uh, the early church didn't translate daemon into a Hebrew word. They just transliterated it as demon. So it uh, th- what we see in the book of First Enoch is what the Greeks believed about the origin of these spirits. It's just the nature of those spirits was very different. The Greeks believed that they were kindly and helpful as long as you sacrificed to them. Considering uh, continuing the practice from the Canaanites, the point of Amar Anus's paper, which was titled "Were There Greek Rephaim," was that the Greeks got the practice of hero worship, you know, Heracles and Theseus and Perseus, from the Greek, from the uh, Canaanites, the uh, the Amorites, and their veneration of the Rephaim. So uh, again, First Enoch, uh, the Book of the Watchers, seems to sort of put this into a Hebrew context, a Jewish context, but it seems to be drawing on ideas that came from the Greeks, who in turn were just recycling religion from the pagan neighbors of ancient Israel. Or maybe they all had a common uh, source or uh, that. before that. Or that. And in other words, uh, it wasn't just that the Greeks took over a new culture and said, okay, we're going to assimilate everything that they have, like the Borg. But they could have had these kind of ideas going on before as well, because everybody came from a common source. Yeah. And there was more cultural cross-pollination than, than we've been taught. I was interested to learn that the, uh, the term in the Bible, the, uh, the people, the Hivites, probably a Hebrewized version of the, the Luvian name Achiawa, which was their term. That's like a southern Turkish, uh, uh, they were southern neighbors of the Hittites, and that was their word for the Mycenaean Greeks. So the Hivites oh, were in the right, land. Right. Yeah. The Kenyans, yeah, that cache of documents right. references all the major places and names of uh, the Trojan War. Wow. Mm-hmm. So the Hivites were essentially Greeks, and they were in the Bible. And in the vicinity of Mount Hermon, by the way, Joshua had to do battle with them in the vicinity of Mount Hermon. So it's not <laughs> not surprising that we found that Greek, uh, that uh, Charles Warren found that Greek stone on the temple on the summit of Mount Hermon. 
by order of the Most High and Holy God, those who swore an oath proceed from here. Well, fellas, we're about an hour in. I, I, can we continue this and maybe get, get more into the uh, New Testament terms for angels and, and what these, uh, these, these different terms mean and just continue this conversation next I think month? there's a lot here, Derek. Uh, you know, I, I think I would like to see us talk about um, the difference between, you know, like a ghost and a, and a demon. Okay. Uh, so kind of entering into how do the human dead play in this as well? Because I think there's a lot of confusion about that. And especially when you come to the Torah and how it forbids certain kinds of things, like what exactly is it forbidding? Um, so I think there's, I think there's quite a bit of room here for us to keep going. Yeah. Well, I get two more months out of this, which is fine with me because it, yeah, it, well, it's, it's, it's weird. It's interesting, but it's also kind of important because I think we all know people who consider themselves Christians who still are, have not ever been given good, good teaching when it comes to the spirit realm. And since the Bible is supposed to be our guidebook and how we interact with the spirit realm, since that's where we're going to spend the rest of eternity, it's kind of important that we, uh, we dig into this and get it right. And I think it's helpful too, for again, you know, the evangelical background that I come from, which tends to sort of, um, you know, just sort of reason away the whole spiritual thing as being um, just not that relevant and reinterpreting a lot of these spiritual passages in terms of earthly powers and such so that they don't have to deal with it. But I, I think it's important for all of us as Christians to have to face this and and realize the reality of this stuff going on. Again, I'm speaking from the the, the, the background that I come from a very sort of a, a, a anti-supernatural Christianity, you know? <laughs> so I think that's why I like doing this because it, it forces me to really see that reality and seek to try to embrace it and understand it in a way that then applies to my life. This stuff is not just in the past in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament. So how does it apply? Amen. Well said. Brian Godawa, best-selling author, award-winning screenwriter. You find his work at Godawa.com. Pastor Doug Van Dorn, Reformed Baptist Church of Northern Colorado in Boulder. His website, DouglasVanDorn.com. And Dr. Judd Burton, our friendly neighborhood PhD, director of the Institute of Biblical Anthropology, BurtonBeyond.com. Guys, always fascinating. I look forward to doing this again next month. You'll find links to our guests' website in the sh- websites, that is, in the show notes, whether you're watching or listening, um, even on the app. They've, uh, the developers of our, our free app have now included the ability to hot link in the notes. So if you're using the mobile app on a mobile device, you can find the links right there. I'll make sure that they're in the notes. But if you're watching at YouTube or uh, wherever else, um, just check the notes and follow the, those notes to uh, Doug, Brian, and uh, uh, Judd's websites as we continue to try to triangulate or quadrangulate, I guess, since there's four of us on uh, th- what the Bible really has for us. God has miraculously preserved this word for us for 2000 years, and he has redeemed us with his own blood. So it's kind of really falls to us as a, as an obligation or just as a way of saying, thank you. Thank you, my King to try to understand his word to the best of our ability. And because of the tools available to us now through the internet, free tools, we can do this in ways that the great theologians of years gone by never could. So let's, uh, let's keep digging next month. We're going to start with a, uh, conversation that we had wanted to include this month and we kind of rabbit trailed and I try to keep these to about an hour or a little over just to keep them to a manageable length but uh, why was there such an explosion of demonic activity or why did Jesus focus so much attention on the activity of demons during his ministry I mean you know there's really not a single incident uh, not a single case in the Old Testament of any of the prophets casting out demons We see a hint of something like that when David played his lyre to soothe the the troubled spirit of Saul, who was being tormented by an evil spirit. But that uh, that wasn't deliverance. It wasn't an exorcism. And yet we see that frequently in the New Testament. Why is that? So we'll discuss that next week and get into some of the various uh, words used by Paul and the other writers in the New Testament to describe these uh, these beings from the spirit realm. 
please uh, take advantage of our mobile app. I've talked about this before, but I can't uh, stress this enough. And while you're doing this, uh, check out the More tab. It's on the far right of the app that uh, gets you links to uh, some other things that we are connected with. Uh, One of those of course, is our store. We've always got uh, a uh, specials, a group of specials that are, are available during the uh, well at any given time. Really, something else we're starting now is uh, our 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 streaming video service. We are putting together some of our teachings and making those available, and, and documentaries really making those available for uh, for you to stream as well. Because especially if you're overseas. The cost of shipping and the delay between the time you order and the time it gets there uh, can be uh, onerous. And again, especially if you're overseas. And the cost of mailing a DVD to you is more than the cost of the DVD itself. Maybe it's better to stream it. So we've got a new streaming video site. We've not really talked about it much as we're uh, kind of soft launching it, wanting to make sure that it works. And uh, everything seems to be going well. So we've got our two travelogumentary documentary videos of our Israel tours that are available out there. We're also putting more individual teachings up on this white website as well. You'll find it at gilberthouse.org slash video, gilberthouse.org slash video, instant access, high definition video. And best of all, you don't have to pay for shipping or VAT if you live somewhere that charges that. So, uh, And then we don't have to worry about um, making sure we've got uh, customs documents that are correct. There, there's software that does it for us, but it's just easier all the way around. If you, so, you know, check it out. Uh, you may find some things that are, that are uh, useful to you, and we pray that uh, it is a blessing to you. Um, you can follow us on social media. We're uh, at uh, View From Bunker on Twitter or at Derek Gilbert. That's my personal Twitter account. Facebook, View From The Bunker. And uh, we're also up on the new social media sites trying to keep up with all of these new developments. Truth Social, Gab Me, We Get Her Parlor, at Derek P. Gilbert. A couple of things to tell you about. First of all, we're going to be in Blue Eye, Missouri. That's uh, Morningside Church, as Sharon and I will be guesting on the Jim Baker Show. This uh, recording session will be on February the 2nd. February 2nd is a, uh, what day of the week is that? Is that a Thursday? Yes, it is a Thursday. Um, Those are open and uh, open to the public and free. You don't have to pay to get in. So uh, if you're in southern Missouri, northern Arkansas, and uh, or just visiting the Ozarks, and you'd like to come down and meet us there, we've got um, information at our website, the right-hand column at gilberthouse.org, also on the app. There's a uh, calendar on the app that uh, leads you to our events and uh, we will uh, we're, we're kind of looking forward to this one this should be a fun discussion we're going to be talking about the great reset and end times prophecy again the uh, appearance at the jim baker show on february 2nd will be in israel on march uh, march 19th through 30th with the optional three-day extension to jordan if um you're thinking about joining us, really, the time is growing very, very short. Uh, not many seats left on that third bus, but uh, if you want to find out more, lipkintours.com or just go to our website, gilberthouse.org slash travel. Really, that's easier because then from there, you can link directly to the page for our tour with Lipkin Tours. They're good people there, Aaron and Letty, Eddie Lipkin. In fact, uh, Aaron will be traveling across the United States this uh, this summer. And uh, we look forward to him uh, coming through, and hopefully we can get together with him. But he'll be speaking at churches all across the country on uh, archaeology and the Holy Land, which is uh, a subject near and dear to our hearts. We've uh, agreed to speak at the Go Therefore conference coming up in July, July 28th through 30th, at the Harvest Revival Center in Brookline, Ohio. That's just outside Dayton. Details on uh, registration and other speakers still to come, but we will give those to you as soon as we get them. And we're still working towards a tour of Turkey in the fall, the Churches of Revelation, Gobekli Tepe, and more. And as soon as we get information on those firm details, we will pass those along to you. A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House and uh, released under Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. Our special thanks to our announcer, DC Good, and to you for giving us your time this week. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is a view from the bunker. Bunker.